Would anyone else like to speak? If not, I think we can get started. If that's great with our panelists. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody. So great to get your feedback and input. Uh, my name is Mary Jury. I am the chief business officer at Blue Alon Records. We're a Los Angeles-based boutique label. We have about 20 artists. Um, I'm also a member of the working group for Music Declares Emergency. Uh, we have been working really hard. We just had the launch of the US chapter for MDE uh, this past Earth Day. So I'm very um, a part of the whole you know, ethical greening uh, issues that surround music and as it relates to record labels and the consumption of music, hence the title of our panel. And so I just want to also introduce my uh, fellow panelists who are amazing people with a wealth of knowledge on this subject. So I will roll it to you, Mike. Okay. I'm uh, Mike Jabara. <clears throat> I'm the CEO of MQA, which is a UK-based audio technology company. Um, and MQA does have a role in what we believe is a more sustainable music ecosystem, but that's really not why I'm here today. Um, most of the last 20 years of my professional life, much of which was spent inside of the Warner Music Group, has included bringing uh, environmental advocacy and more sustainable practices into the music ecosystem. So <clears throat> as an example, I, I brought the Natural Resources Defense Council into Warner as part of an initiative to change all of the paper and uh, board packaging going back some time so that there was no uh, virgin paper or pulp being used in all post-consumer. Um, <clears throat> also led an initiative in the early days of digital to create centralized storage of audio and video assets so that we wouldn't result, we wouldn't have the uh, proliferation of duplicate storage that we have today, which will be a topic we talk about in a minute. Um, and so very happy to be here and appreciate everybody attending. Horst? Okay. Yeah. My name is Horst Beinmüller. I created K7 <coughs> 1985, and I was also one of the founding members of A2IM, and we're operating out of New York, London, and Berlin, have about 45 to 50 employees at the moment. Uh, but I think more importantly is that I created, in 2000, I created the Impala Sustainability Task Force, because I felt that sustainability is something we need to address as a sector and not individually because it's an overwhelming complex issue. And through that task force, I gathered the European pioneers of that topic and brought them together and we got advisors in and we developed recommendations for all European independent labels. We developed a carbon meter, which is bespoke for the music industry to assess a carbon footprint. I developed an international expert group, which brings again experts together to define responsibilities, like give recommendations on offsets, speak about responsibility on shipping, defining responsibility on shipping. Where does the responsibility for a label start? Where does it end? We also were the group who established that streaming is not the responsibility of labels, which we discussed with Spotify. So there's this, this is, this is my, my, my passion. And being surrounded by so many experts has enabled me to develop for my own company quite a progressive carbon reduction program, which I published April this year, including our footprint. And I think that probably brings me here. And um, I'm very much believing in sharing because uh, if I can tell you anything which saves the world next year three tons of carbon, I think I've done a good job. So I'm very passionate about sharing all the information. So also feel free to reach out to me. I am give as much as I can consultation for free. Thanks, you guys. So there was a study done by Turn Up the Volume, and the survey showed that 82% of music fans are concerned about climate change. Um, this is high compared to generally 72% of the public. And also 54% of music fans want tackling climate change to be a priority compared to 40% of the general public. So there is a clear um, relationship to the music sector wanting to have this be an issue that we tackle. Um, there's definitely a, 
you know, a uh, taste for a more prominent role for the music industry to take in accelerating this transition to um, a more green situation. Uh, but as Horst was saying, it's really, it's a, it's a huge subject and we find that a lot of people when trying to figure out what to do, kind of throw their hands up in the air because when they start diving in, there's just so many areas and so much information that it can seem really overwhelming. And so, hence, we don't have a really uh, huge amount of time today either. So we're going to kind of try and stick to some of the basic parameters of it. So one of the first things um, that we thought would be good for you all, you know, as maybe labels, would be what are the first sort of concrete steps that labels can take to move forward in supporting, you know, reducing their carbon and moving more towards sustainability. And as Horst was mentioning, limit our warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start with Horst, maybe some, some first steps that people yeah. can take. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that people are still hopeful we can match 1.5. I think we won't, but this should not stop our motivation. Um, yeah, so we're speaking about low-hanging fruits. I mean, we all know that the overall ambition is to have your personal footprint. Your personal footprint shows you your carbon hotspots and you're reducing them. And by reducing them, you're also reducing your cost in the future because in the future we will have a carbon tax. So an assessment is also a security that you streamline your company already now to be cost effective in the future. But the low hanging fruits for all of us is green energy. With switching to green energy, you're automatically reducing your footprint of your operation by 50%, more or less, depending on your operation. And, uh, and the good thing is also when you say, I'm committed to sustainability, I probably will use the A2IM carbon meter, which Impala is transferring to A2IM. You can already start now switching to green energy. And once you have your assessment, you see the impacts. And you can already show whoever you want to show it to, your artists, your clients, hey, look, this in 22, I switched to green energy. We already reduced our carbon for our office by 30%. We already saved 15 tons. And that's, that's what it's all about. It's reducing carbon. So I would encourage you guys, if you're serious, switch to green energy. Carbon tax will come. We in Germany, we are in a situation that it's very difficult to find good green energy because through the carbon tax, energy prices leveled out and the green energy providers are maxed out in capacity. So as more ahead of the curve you are, as better it is for your company. The other thing is, um, is, is I think you call it near mint vinyl. So it's not a much, you, can, you can't change your manufacturing. You know, you can't, you're probably happy to get a capacity of somebody pressing your vinyl and you can't tell them how to press your vinyl because you're happy to get it in time. But what you can do is you can try to find arrangement with your distributor that near mint vinyl does not get destroyed and you're going to sell it to D to C. And therewith, you're reducing a lot of carbon, which otherwise would be destroyed. And uh, we made very good experience with it. It's a difficult process because for our distributors, it's very difficult because it has the same barcode, the same catalog number. So you have to extract it from your distributors and sell it D to C. But that's a very efficient way of, of, of saving, um, saving vinyl and saving carbon. Yeah, I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit. Um, and Horst's label has done a great job, so you could grab a blueprint, I think, from the work that they've done. Many people find it helpful to have a mental framework of how to think about emissions. And there are a lot of things that we can take from work that's been done in the past. So the greenhouse gas uh, emissions protocol breaks emissions into three areas, what they call scopes one, scopes two, and scopes three. Many of you may have seen that. And there are great tools and organizations that can help you in that measurement process. But scope one is basically um, emissions generated by you as an individual or the business that you operate. Scope two is really looking at where you might buy it or um, acquire it through vendors and purchases. And then scope three are those more indirect emissions that might require collaboration between companies. Um, I think what's interesting for us as an industry is as we look at something, and I know we'll talk in a minute about about both physical and digital consumption, but some of our challenges to really reduce 
what's happening in music require us to attack the scope three stuff as well. So it's great for each of us to be individually going after those emissions and converting, as Horst says, to green energy for our operations. But we have to be willing to come together in sessions like this, but also create working groups that are going to tackle some of the bigger problems because they're made jointly. And in fact, as you all know, <clears throat> today's streaming ecosystem is a result of agreements between copyright holders, um, infrastructure providers, digital service providers, and it's only going to be through cooperation in those relationships that we're going to fundamentally change how people access music and how much emission is generated during that consumption process. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get my water. Yeah, thank, thanks you guys. And, and um, Horace, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the um, carbon calculator that you all that you guys developed. I, I find that to be really a, a, a cool thing <laughs> um, that, that allows you to see exactly what your, your carbon footprint is. Yeah, so the assessment of a, of a carbon footprint is, is regulated, or the framing is regulated by the greenhouse gas protocol. So it's not like Impala came up to say what we think is important to have in a footprint. It's, it's science, taste, fixed. But in between there, there are very, very variances which for our business which are important. For instance, I give you an example. There's an element there which captures destruction of records. You don't find a Google carbon calculator or any other calculator is specialized in destruction of records. You know, There's, of course, a big element when it comes. There is the, the other thing which is important, <clears throat> that in this calculator, there are the emissions for all formats already um, in, in the progr programmed in the, in, the, in the code. So you just enter how many vinyls you have manufactured, and the program tells you how much carbon is included. You know? And uh, these figures are coming from the first pressing plants which made analysis. They might change in the future. It's all early days. But um, it, it takes you through a journey through. It takes you through a journey to your entire organization. And you enter all the data you have. And it gives you a recommendation and guides you. So it's not only an Excel sheet where you enter numbers and it gives you a sum. It gives you guidance. And we have now in Europe 18 people using it, 18 labels using it. Uh, we have seen the first report. I think Ninja Tune is the first company who released their report yesterday. And we expect another ones to, to, to release their, their <coughs> carbon footprint and the report in the course of the year. Within Impala, we support that. We have groups, we have learning. And these are all the things we would like to bring it to America because we feel in Impala there is a lot of knowledge or things we already established we would like to bring in A2IM. Great, thank you. Um, so we all know that streaming has become sort of the predominant way that people do consume music these days. And if you guys are like me, you've all experienced the thing where if you acquire a catalog or some you know, music that had been uploaded before, you have to take it all down and then you have to re-ingest it. And, um, it just seems somewhat inefficient. So uh, we wanted to take some time right now to talk about sort of the sustainability of the streaming ecosystem. And uh, on that one, I'm going to start with you, Mike. Sure. I think this conversation begins with just sharing information and educating all of us about what um, the realities around streaming compared to, I think, the perception. Um, if you look at most of the research data that's out, I'll, I'll cite in this case Kyle Devine's book on Decompose, which is looking at the current state of music. Our streaming environment is about twice as dirty as the music industry was during the time of the CD at its peak. Um, and that can be counterintuitive for a lot of folks because they think about physical media made out of petroleum products and say that obviously was the dirtiest um, period for us. When in fact, in a streaming world, we're regularly accessing on servers um, and across CDNs, content that would have been purchased one time and then kept locally, if you want to think about the CD or vinyl experience as being something like that. And so most of our approaches to improvements around streaming should be, I think, trying to simulate or approach that same type of acquire at once, but continue to get the benefits of what we see as digital recurring consumption. Um, and when you look at what today's ecosystem 
is contributing to overall greenhouse gas emission that really breaks down into about three buckets. So storage of everybody's digital assets is roughly 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. The transmission part, getting it from there across CDNs in various forms, about 30%. And then the remainder is local consumption. And that's everything from bringing it down to the device, the recharging of my battery, all of the things that happen around our devices. And so if we, and kind of going back to the scope three um, category of things, if we started to look at each of those and say, what could we do to material impact each of those three buckets, um, some things jump out at you, right? Why do we have thousands of duplicate data center locations of exactly the same sound recordings, right? There's a missed opportunity and something that we probably can't just let happen again. Um, I mentioned earlier about an initiative that went back to 2006 and seven, where there was agreement among major record companies to consolidate those assets. And it was an early desperate time, I would say, for music companies where anybody willing to do a deal for paid licensing of music um, ultimately led to compromises around good infrastructure thinking. And unfortunately, that good idea was lost. And ultimately, we find ourselves where we are today with a real problem in terms of duplicate data center and asset storage. So that's one that we can't give up on. And there are great organizations like Vilvit in Norway and others that are looking at how to consolidate in a thoughtful way. Another one, though, that um, we should be talking about is how do we create better experiences through UI for streaming fans so that they get what feels like a very easy streaming experience, even if most of the storage or all of the storage is happening locally, right? Imagine if either behind the scenes or without us having to go in and know how to do caching, know how to do presets on all of our playlists, what if it was easier for people to bring it down once for the software to recognize how frequently I'm accessing music and then just to make thoughtful decisions about keeping content locally rather than going back all the time. And there are a lot of ideas along the way that can help us chip away at that. And I think there will be some best practices published soon that take those three big buckets and break it down into some very simple things that both consumers and services and the music industry and copyright holders could do in order to significantly reduce our footprint. <clears throat> I just want to be able to acquire that catalog and then just be like, blue Alon, just switch it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Horst, I know you have some some streaming. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, I'm 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 not that concerned about streaming, and um, I know I already raised a couple of eyebrows saying that in formal meetings because it is a presumption that streaming also has testified, is really dirty. I think there's one reason that streaming is mainly done by public companies. And public companies deal with the uncertainty of carbon tax and an uncertain cost center. And if something is a threat to public companies, it's unknown costs. So what we see is that the majority of streaming services, either it's Apple, if it's Spotify or whatever, you name it, they all have a net zero commitment. And the reason why they have a net zero commitment is probably not that much because they, are, they want to save planet Earth. It's because they're scared of not having a clear cost center for the years to come. And for them, it's cheaper to develop a net zero plan and have that in their balance sheet going forward than saying, we don't know. It can be 25 or it can be 150. And that is also a good example how a government regulated sustainability. And we are also, with our experts group, we also in exchange with Spotify, uh, they are a little bit uh, most ahead on this conversations because they are also in the easiest situation. They're a standalone streaming service. They're not an Apple or a Facebook or whatever. So they're just this just streaming service. And for them, it's also a very important topic. They, they, they're developing all the programs and grids and everything. It's, of course, a big corporation. And uh, they're very open. They're very open. We're speaking to them. They, they, we have the same goal. We have the same goal, as they are, of, of creating a clean, carbon reduced, as much as reduced as possible, down to free musical environment. Um, so 
I think it's something which certainly needs to be fixed, and there's a lot of things we heard which needs to be fixed. I'm not disagreeing with them, but I think on the end result, we agreeing with the streaming companies that it has to be net zero, and there's no argument against it from any of those. Yeah. I think not to get into a debate about it, but the challenge um, from my perspective is the time frame. Of course, up to right. I agree and whether with we can count on the public markets to move as quickly as are required. I also, it's not clear to me if we leave it just to the markets, how structural problems such as <clears throat> an agreement between a major copyright holder and a single DSP results in the consolidation, the reduction of, of duplicate data centers. Right, we shouldn't just convert to green. We should reduce consumption Absolutely. where we can altogether. Absolutely. And I think in that case. It could be um, um, a use of green energy that really should be deployed elsewhere if we're using it to power something that's duplicate or redundant Absolutely. in its nature. After, but I, there, if I go in, but there are really hope on the consumer because that what we see at the moment, we don't see any real sustainability plans which are visible on any of the streaming services. I, I hope if once the first one comes through and call, they are so credible that they can call themselves on a pathway of being a green streaming service. I'm sure it won't take long for the others to follow and to become very concrete because their competition works again. And I'm here with you. It's it's a question of time. Is we can't let that go for seven, eight years and pollute and pollute and pollute. You know, we need to be fast. But let's the first one come out. I know the first ones are coming out soon, and the dynamic will start. The competition will start. At the moment, sustainability on streaming is not a competition point but it will become a competition point, luckily to the awareness of our consumers. And I mean, I think a lot of you all might be members of Merlin, so I don't know if you all want to speak to this idea of Merlin having a central location storage center. Whew. I'm on the board <laughs> of Merlin. Uh, Perhaps you want to start. I find it very, well, very I, interesting. I think, I think it opens up a great um, part of this discussion, which is the importance of innovation and invention and helping us allow people to continue to run businesses, to compete, create great consumer experiences, but making improvements along the way through technical innovations. I think what you might be referring to there, Mary, is some of the discussion that's gone around inside of Merlin. Hey, are we doing as much as we can to consolidate that same set of base assets that then get distributed onward. Um, one of the reasons that some of us were so excited in 2005, six and seven around going to a hosted model was because we thought it would actually drive innovation around the consumer experience. Imagine this, if every DSP in the world never had to put another dime into storage infrastructure and all they did was innovate around experience and competed on how is this music and this video and this metadata presented to you differently in the competitive way compared to another service? Our industry wouldn't be blamed for having lots of all of the same services. We would be seeing some of the kind of innovation I think that other entertainment categories enjoy, where every game is not the same or every video programming is not the same. So we got ourselves in this box of having to maintain and feed duplicate infrastructure that adds no value to the consumer experience and so anywhere we can go to say, let's do less of that and more around experience has to be good for consumers, probably good for our business. And as we compete with other industries that seem to be out innovating us on a regular basis, maybe we get some of that share of wallet and time back as well, which is critically important. Merlin. So uh, for those who don't know, I'm, I avoided that. I'm, 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 a, I'm a founding member of Merlin. So I, I know this organization quite well and I'm very proud to be on the board of Merlin. Um, yes, um, wouldn't it be amazing that we would have one storage for all Merlin members and this distribution center would deliver to anybody? It would be amazing. Probably only would put six companies out of business. And I don't know if we can do that as Merlin, to put six companies out of business. And I don't know what would happen if we would do that. So I think in principle, even we have not discussed it within Merlin, everybody would agree that it's a good idea. How we work around the effects of not destroying the market is the real challenge. And I think that's where Merlin needs time, long time to develop solutions for, because Merlin is not a delivery company. Merlin is a collective rights management company, and that's what it should remain to be. 
Great, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so we're going to move on to the vinyl topic now. So I'm sure that you guys are all aware that vinyl has become extremely popular and, and is inherently somewhat not green. Um, so there's a lot of issues surrounding what you can do um, to try to reduce your carbon footprint when it comes to vinyl. And so I just wanted to take some time to talk with these guys who have so much info about this, um, about what they see going forward that we can do surrounding the vinyl issue as it continues to increase in popularity. I think, I, I, Mike, let's start with you. <laughs> it's a challenge because this is an area that does require significant innovation. Um, as Horst, who's looked at this space a lot, um, talks about and has shared, there's there's real inefficiency when it comes to energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions in the production process before you even start to talk about the material side of it. You know, we all might go toward the material piece as the area for opportunity, um, but you'd have to look at how that plastic is smashed and quickly cooled and all the good things that happen there. So I'm, I'm probably going to speak less about vinyl and let Horst speak about that more because yeah, he stares at the space. But I'll, but I'll talk about the fact that not not all of these things are going to be solved just through reduction. We are going to have to come up with better methods and, and better materials so that we can eliminate petroleum wherever we find it or a flame wherever you see it. Those yeah. are the kind of touchstones, I think, of what a more sustainable environment is going to be is to identify the waste or the inefficiency of the greenhouse gas emissions and do what we can to reduce um, and then replace it where possible. So I'll turn it over to you because... Yeah, I mean, uh, vinyl is the epicenter of K7's footprint because it's 97% of our emission. So it every, you can say, why are we actually doing anything? We should just focus on vinyl. The reason for that is our structure of our labels. We run the label strut. Strut has a 70% vinyl share, which is beautiful to have if you don't look into carbon. It's amazing to have such a label, but uh, when you look into carbon, it's, it's keeping you up at night. So what we do is, I mean, A, we see a market which is not working on the market condition, as I explained before. There are no green pressing plants because there's no need for a green pressing plant because everybody is filling its caps. You know. um, what what we have done is we have switched around whatever we can switch around from sea freight to America to uh, FSC paper, but the core, the vinyl, we cannot change and we, we have to wait. Um, I'm quite optimistic that there will be a change and the change is the combination of increased capacities. We see that all over the world the vinyl capacity is increasing. We see I think we are going into a recession, and the recession will hit the vinyl market, not the streaming market, but it will hit the luxury products of vinyl. And, uh, and we will see innovation. Evolution Music is working on alternative compounds and everything. And I know that there are already the first pressing plants preparing themselves to become very green. And they're not doing that because they they want to save only planet Earth is because they knowing there will be a competitive market in probably three years, and then they want to be on the forefront of being sustainable. And that's unfortunately what we have to wait for. We can't change it. It's, we can't change the system. We can only show what we can do better within the system, but we cannot change the carbon intensity of vinyl. Yeah. So that's unfortunately, it's not sounding very exciting. We wait and we hope for. And we can't do anything at the moment because, we, of course, we're pressing our records. What else shall we do? I also need to fly to New York. I couldn't take a boat. There's certain necessity, necessity in the market you just have to accept, you know. Can you um, talk a little bit more, Horst, though, when you were um, talking to me about it, about how it isn't just so much that it's made from petrochemicals, but it's also in the, and you, you spoke to this a little bit, Mike, in the, in the, cooling process, the, the most intense part of the vinyl yeah. reproduction is the, the energy it takes to cool it down. Yeah, so everybody is looking at the moment on new materials. I think it's extremely important because the, the PVC as such is dirty as hell. But uh, the energy intensity is coming from the manufacturing process of 
bringing the hot vinyl into the pressing plant and cooling the entire process of a record going in and going out is, I think, 40 seconds. And within 40 seconds, the vinyl has to be cooled down from 120 degrees to 30 degrees to be able to take it out. And that's a very energy intense process. And, um, and, 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 and that is something you can't change. I'm hopeful that, the, that new materials will be easier to be cooled, you know, because then it, the cooling is happening first. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm hopeful. I have to say it's also very economical. If, if we get a carbon tax, and I have to pay for all my manufacturings of vinyl, carbon tax on top is an additional increase, you know, I don't want to have. So I'm under economical pressure to find a solution. I don't want to wait for carbon tax to come in, in Germany. Luckily, we have one of the most advanced governments when it comes to carbon tax, you know. So be hopeful. And um, the manufacturing process, we hope that new materials will be easier to cool. OK, uh, I think we wanted to go at this point to asking some questions for you guys. So I hope that you all would maybe have some um, questions for these guys. All right, yeah, just raise your hands. I'll come around with the mic. Uh, well, Lisa, you want to go first? <laughs> it's her panel, right? Yeah. <laughs> This isn't so much a question, just as, you know, kind of it can open up a little bit more of a conversation, because I think right now when we were talking about all of the vinyl dilemmas, we're focused more strictly on the manufacturing, but we're not talking so much about, like, what labels can actually do once they receive the product. Like, anytime something is sent out and a customer gets it and, you know, one of the gatefolds is bolted and they want to send it back in for something else or different ways to look at alternatives to shrink wrap and... You know, even the little download cards that come with it. Are there any tips that we can kind of provide to all of the members who are here today on what they can actually do once the product is totally over, it's in their hands, they're sending it out to the consumer, simple ways that they can kind of make sure that they're reducing their carbon footprint as much as possible. Like, again, let's say even if you get sent um, a record and, you know, the cover is um, uh, messed up a little bit, you give that person a 10% coupon for the next purchase that they get, you know, in an effort to help them keep that and not re uh, reduce the waste and, and so on. I, 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 have, I have a good example from K7 I can share. Um, in 2019, we switched our shipping from Europe to America to sea freight. Uh, in order to give contacts, it's about 20,000 units every year we're shipping into the States. We did not know the impact because we had no carbon meter. Now we have a carbon meter and we know, oh, let me just, I don't know the precise ton, but I should roughly know, but I know it is 13% of our carbon footprint we reduced just using sea freight into, into America. So that was substantial. So I think it would, must be something around 40 tons, you know? Is that something that, like, does that extend how long it takes to order yes, a vinyl? Is that something that you guys it's communicate week, it's to your week, customers it's and you weeks, let them know? Okay. It's a two weeks extension. Mm -hmm. It's a two weeks extension in the manufacturing process if you want to have simultaneous release dates. We do simultaneous release dates on priority releases. On specialist releases, we have separate vinyl release dates from our side in the US, from your side, it would be in Europe. And that made a big difference. And nearly bent, mint, I mentioned before, you know, that's, I think that's something we can save a lot and also make a lot of money again because people appreciate uh, you can be transparent about what is broken on the record and, and we, sell, we, we sell all of our near mint vinyl, you know, and... Um, we, we actually, we make our vinyl in Czechoslovakia, yeah. <laughs> which is, seems counterintuitive, but... Uh, so then, you know, during the pandemic, we were forced to have it come on a boat from Czechoslovakia to the U.S. And uh, it, yes, it definitely increases the timeline. How but much, it how also, much did it increase? How much does it increase for you, the, the timeline? Oh, it's like a month. A month? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. But I mean, that could be related to pandemic issues as far as like the shipping and containers and all of that business. But uh, I would say that there was a lot less um, damage. Yeah. So I don't know if that's been documented in any way, but I have seen, you know, I see the record store things where they talk about so much of the shipping of the vinyl is, it results in a lot of damage. And I mean, I'm, I think inherently trying to reduce that would 
reduce the energy consumption yeah. around and I, replacing it or making new ones. And it's a cost center. I mean, if you manage to go to sea freight, you're saving a lot of money and you're saving a lot of carbon. And I think what you all have to ask yourself, and I can't answer that from a European or German perspective for America, what is happening with carbon tax? If carbon tax hits America, you won't find any sea freight anymore. It will be gone. If you think carbon tax will come, better sort out your sea freight routes now in order to have them when the carbon tax is there. Because then the capacity. When the carbon tax will come and uh, the full prices for air freight will raise, will, will, will raise, the demand on sea freight will increase, and then there will be no more capacity. So as earlier you structure your company, regardless, depending how, how, how important shipping to Europe is, as earlier you structure it, as better it is for your company. A, you're saving already money now because it's much cheaper. B, you have less destructives. And C, when the carbon tax come and there's a run on sea freight, you have an established business relationship nobody can interrupt. Jody? Um. Thank you. Uh, this comes from Maria, who uh, myself kind of teetering back and forth about little things we do to just absolute despair. It's like feeling guilty that we're, you know, bringing kids into the world. But you know, hell like this is, is great. Um, and I don't want to be too negative, so um, I'm trying to think the most politically sensitive way to say this. What is your thought on the kind of um, the rush that we saw from some sectors of the music community to NFTs without ever, it seemed like even a cursory um, glance at what the impact could be. Um, I think thankfully we've seen the, the cooling of this initial crypto boom, but you know, the underlying technology is probably not going away. Um, and the amount of energy just used in the last three years just in that sector, I mean, it can, I mean, it dwarfs you know some of some of the things we're talking about today. So I just, you know, I think we're. Um, I don't like to police what other people do in our industry, but uh, is there a way that maybe when we see something like that happening again, like leaders, organizations can kind of come in a little bit earlier and say, hey, maybe you guys aren't you know considering what this what this is actually doing. Um, sorry, I know that's sort of a broad topic. No, that's fair. And maybe I'm going to show my age a little bit, but I'm actually quite hopeful based, because of the reaction. I feel like there were a lot of voices early on saying the energy considerations um, need to be factored in here. And I think it created relatively early on pressure. There's a, there's a separate issue, which is the market for NFTs and that experience. And that it is sorting itself out, I think, in some extent. So if I were to compare that as a new experience compared to things that happened just 15 years ago. <clears throat> the voice is much louder saying we have to take this into consideration. And this is a, a great topic um, that I would want to touch on before we all leave today, which is we need to be approaching this with some urgency. Um, we've made a decision in my company that we're not going to participate in events that don't talk about this topic as part of the conference. So you won't see us at events that aren't looking at this as an existential threat um, I think it's one of the reasons that I'm so turned on about what Music Declares Emergency is doing, is they're just saying the message loud and clear, right? No music on a dead planet. There's no plainer way for us to communicate how important this is. And so we should all wake up day, uh, every day with some element of the agenda that day or that week that's going to contribute to this topic. And I think there is that momentum because NFT and blockchain more generally, I think is going to evolve and innovate more quickly than it would have in different times because there's an awareness of it. Separately, I think the idea of decentralized transactions is an exciting thing for lots of other reasons. So the, the collision of the commercial opportunity and the <clears> environmental <throat> responsibility, I think will result in something quite good, even though it's messy and bumpy right now, I believe. Rich. We got one over here first, sorry. Okay. Hey, um, how, how do you think it's best to incentivize plants to push like greener practices? Because I'd recently, um, was looking at, uh, I forget the plant, but I think it was in Denmark, because uh, they offered like a greener pressing. Um, and you know, what that actually is, you know, I'm not clear of, but when I was generating the CPU from the quote, I kind of got, uh, you know, it's, it's much higher than, 
and lonely. So, you know, like we said, like all these plants are booked. Um, they don't really have an issue with business. It's not like, uh, we're not seeing like people not pressing at plants because they're not like green yet. So what, you know, how can we enforce that? Because there's so many, like that plant you mentioned, like GZ, it's like the biggest plant in the world and people are pressing all over now. So it's not like one government can enforce regulations on their plants. It has to be like a global thing. So what does that look like, do you think? I, I think, as I mentioned before, I think uh, competition is going to regulate the market. And at the moment, we have no competition in vinyl. I mean, we see that. You know, I, I, I have, from my point of view, I think I have a sizable company and I have a sizable amount of vinyl manufacturing every year. But I can't leverage that against my pressing plant to become more green. They laugh at me and say, you can go somewhere else. I sell your capacity tomorrow. The market is out of order. And we have to wait for the market to come in order that there is competition and people preparing to offer green manufacturing. As green as it can be at the moment, it doesn't, it's not, it's not carbon free. It always have elements of carbon in it. That's impossible to achieve at this stage or in the next years to come. But, and, uh, and I, I, as I've said before, the dynamic of the capacities worldwide increasing, a recession coming in on, on, on luxury, a recession coming having impact on luxury product or expensive product like vinyl and the carbon tax will drive the current press, vinyl pressing market into a competitive market again. And then green, then you can make the choice. Then you can make the choice in saying, I want to be green, therefore I'm going to this pressing plant. At the moment you can't. I think there's also an opportunity for us to promote and celebrate the people that are leading in this space even if it creates some short-term commercial pain. Not to jump back to the paper side of things, but when we converted to post-consumer paper and board, there wasn't the tooling, there wasn't the supply. On a per-unit basis, digipacks were much more expensive than jewel cases were. So we had to be willing as an industry, and I was at Warner, so we could only commit Warner's volume to this, that somebody was going to get disproportionate share of our business by making the move, which was what would be required in order for us to even get close to the per-unit costs that we were spending in a world that was filled with plastic. So right now where the competition maybe isn't quite there because of the demand being greater than the capacity, all of us who care need to be telling about these people that are leading and turning that into brand equity for them and positive associations for the people that do business with them. Yeah, and you have to commit to the cost. Like when I was at New West, we just made a, a, a definite, you know, intention to not use plastic and, and so we knew it was going to cost us more to manufacture all our product but we we just we just decided as a company that that's something we needed to do so i mean i think you have to be prepared for that as well uh, on the NFT subject there are options of the blockchain that you uh, produce your nfts on and for example the blockchain algorand is claiming, and they've got a big website, part of their website up, that they are net zero, <laughs> as opposed to if you do it on uh, Bitcoin or Ether, which I understand Ether is really making a real effort to, to you know, be more energy efficient. Uh, Solana is also another blockchain that is claiming to be net zero or near net zero. So there's real options there. And of course, you know, if you're doing something that's not only music, but maybe art, and you're doing a bunch of NFTs, this really makes a difference there. So uh, again, Algorand, Solana, um, these are some options. And I think this is something that artists, managers aren't really thinking of. I think it's NFT, and I think mostly it's going to Ether right now, from what I understand. Um, I'm looking to get more knowledgeable on this, but 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 there are options. Yeah. But I think I think I think what you're saying is 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 really important. But it also shows that carbon is everywhere, and if you look at the entire carbon world, you get overwhelmed because you can't manage it. It's too complex. I mean, find your things, find your low-hanging fruit, and focus on that. You can't change your company overnight because you're going to get frustrated. Pick two, three things focus on them, start with them, and make an impact, and, uh, and take step after step. And then 
whatever is your priority. If NFT is your priority, look at, at sustainable NFT production. If vinyl manufacturing is your priority, look into sea freight, you know. Put your, put, your, put your operations on green energy, put your service on green energy. This has all impacts, but don't pick more than two or three to start with because no one of you can probably afford at this stage a sustainability manager. Uh, well, one other comment here. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago, and I don't know that I'm exactly quoting this correctly or not, but minting an NFT on, on um, uh, uh, hello, what's the biggest one? Huh? Yeah, uh, could, could be the amount of energy of powering a town of 100,000 people for two months. Um, so it, it could be huge. So there's a real reason to look at that. Bit, uh, Bitcoin is what I'm saying, too. You know, minted on Bitcoin. All right. Uh, we have one, time for one more question. We're going to have to wrap up. I'm just wondering what you think about, I mean, with the sustainable development goals of the UN and ESGs with, in the stock market and the corporations who are uh, kind of dedicated to spending money to support these things in terms of the environment. Uh, what about also, you know, the artists' responsibilities, the songwriters' responsibilities, not only to use energy efficiently in the manufacture and distribution and NFTs and crypto and all that, but also to, you know, write songs about, you know, music declaring emergency or, you know, the different aspects of because obviously songwriting and uh, music and lyrics and message Extremely are powerful. Su super powerful, super important game changers for the world. I mean, I'm old enough to remember lots of game changers for the world it, with, with songs, with music, with uh, artists who were committed to uh, environmental action and to you know, saving the planet, basically. Well, I mean, what would you guys and <laughs> what would you all think about you know, how to actually, you know, motivate people to, to think and to write and to speak and to sing and to rap and everything else for this kind of environment, environmental justice, social justice, uh, um, et cetera. You know, it, it's, it's interesting that I am in the room with a bunch of people. We've been speaking on this exact topic as a part of Music Declares Emergency, and we found that it's interesting of course there are always artists who are motivated and want to speak out there's you know billy eilish is very very green and motivated and speaks out on it a lot but we've also found that artists you know have a tendency to not want to come do anything that their fans might be resistant to so there's there's also the artists who are concerned about some backlash or if they're speaking out about something and seems not so right. So we've been trying to cr craft ways to give artists tools to talk about or sing about or, you know, create their art that works for them within this, like, really broad, you know, climate spectrum and, like, what that, how that works for them to, to incorporate it into their bodies of work, you know, where they're meeting it where they are, you know, like what they're comfortable with doing. I think that's why being fact-based and getting the data out into um, the environment is important because we don't want artists to feel like they're putting themselves at risk. And as we all know, next to, next to parents, artists and entertainers are the most influential voices in the lives of children as they're developing. So it's wonderful when some of them step out. But just like we saw also in, digital, in the digital marketing world, some love it, some don't want to participate. I don't think that we can, as a group, push them out front and say, now tell the story. And many of them need to undergo the same education um, influence that standard consumers do, which is they don't know the facts. And I think this is a problem that's solved by talking about detail and making sure that people understand the facts and the detail and then saying, okay, what are we gonna do about that? A, a great example um, and another intersection between great experience and the need for innovation is around higher quality audio, right? It's great that now the mainstream of consumers and services are talking about the importance of higher quality audio. Most people don't know that a 192.24 PCM file is about 80% wasted space and only about 20% musical information in it. So we're spending a lot of time streaming the full fat file 
which is generating, all, consuming a lot more data and generating a lot more energy in the name of better audio. Well, how do we achieve that same better or even improved audio, but taking advantage of the knowledge that we have that that file is filled with air? And what are we doing in that space? In this particular area, and not to be a plug, but that's our technology at MQA is an example of an innovation in that space. And so we need to be looking at all of those opportunities, putting the data out there, being non-emotional in what the data presents, and then those people that can speak about it, they come from the creative community, so be it. Um, in general, I'm not sure if songwriting or writing lyrics about that is, is what most of them are inclined to do, unless you're an artist who's been a public policy or a political voice in the past. I think this is a tough one for, for many people to start to find their voice in that way. Regardless of what my personal aspirations might be, hard to imagine pushing them out in front of the curtain that way. All right, I'm sorry to cut us off. Can we get a round of applause for our uh, panelists real quick? <laughs> okay. Please, if you have any questions for the panelists, please take it outside pretty quickly. We've got a room full of people ready for the next panel. Thank you.